I'm going to tell you a name, and you tell me which celebrity it is their real name. Are you ready? This is a good one. Let's start with one that many of you may know, Reginald Kenneth Dwight. Reginald Kenneth Dwight. Thank you, Elton John. Bonus points in the back of the room. Now let's dive deeper. How about Catherine Hudson? Mm-hmm. Catherine Hudson changed her name to Katy Perry. Mm-hmm. How about Mark Sinclair? This one's one of my favorites. Mark Sinclair. That's Vin Diesel. Vin Diesel, Mark Sinclair. That was a good name change. Um, Carlos Irvin Estevez. Amelia, nope. Charlie Sheen. Charlie Sheen. Eric Marlin Bishop. Eric Marlin Bishop. Jamie Foxx. Another good name change. How about Robin Fenty? Robin Fenty. Anybody? Rihanna. 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 Good, good choices. Last one. Audrey Perry. Audrey Perry. Faith Hill. Yeah, yeah, people changing their names. Did you know that in Texas, you can file for a name change? Now, you don't have to get married to do this, but you can go to the courthouse. Chapter 45, subchapter B of the Texas Code says that you can schedule with a judge and legally change your name to whatever you so choose with one caveat, if it's bad for the general public. But you can change your name, $300 in a court date. You can change your name to whatever you want it to be, unless it's weird. And then the judge just says no. But you can change your name, and this is what's happened to all of these celebrities. They've changed their name. In our reading today, as we are reading through the New Testament this past week, we're starting into the books of Timothy, uh, Paul's letters to Timothy, um, this pastor that he's left behind, probably, if we're being honest, probably a middle-aged guy amongst a bunch of really old fuddy-duds in the church. So he tells Timothy things like, um, set the example of faith. Don't let anybody look down upon you because of your youth. Uh, we always think that Timothy's a 20-year-old. Historians believe he's probably 30s or 40s. But just imagine for a second what Paul's really talking to Timothy about as we're going to be in 1 Timothy chapter 1. But as you're finding your way to 1 Timothy chapter 1, I want to take you back in Scripture to a passage we've already read. But just keep 1 Timothy chapter 1. This other one's going to be on the screen for you. In Acts chapter 9, story goes like this. Now Saul was still breathing threats and murder against the disciples of the Lord. He went to the high priest and requested letters from him to the synagogues in Damascus so that he might find any men or women who belonged to the way. He might bring them as prisoners to Jerusalem. As he was traveling and nearing Damascus, a light from heaven suddenly flashed around him. Falling down to the ground, he heard a voice saying to him, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? Who are you, Lord? Saul said. I'm Jesus, the one you're persecuting, he replied. But get up and go into the city, and you'll be told what you must do. The men who were traveling with him stood speechless, hearing the sound but seeing no one. Saul got up from the ground, and though his eyes were open, he, had, he could see nothing. So they took him by the hand and led him into Damascus. He was unable to see for three days and did not eat or drink. There was a disciple in Damascus named Ananias. And the Lord said to him in a vision, Ananias, here, I'm, here I am, Lord, he replied. Get up and go to the street called Straight, the Lord said to him, to the house of Judas. And ask for a man from Tarsus named Saul since he is praying there. In a vision, he has seen a man named Ananias coming in and placing his hands on him so that he may regain his sight. Lord, Ananias answered, I've heard from many people about this man, how much harm he has done to your saints in Jerusalem. He has had authority here from the chief priests to arrest all who call on your name. But the Lord said to him, Go, 
For this man is my chosen instrument to take my name to the Gentiles, kings and Israelites, and I will show him how much he must suffer for my name. And Ananias went and entered the house, and he placed his hands on him and said, Brother Saul, the Lord Jesus who appeared to you on the road you were traveling has sent me so that you may regain your sight and be filled with the Holy Spirit. At once something like scales fell from his eyes, and he regained his sight. Then he got up and was baptized, and after taking some food, he regained his strength, and Saul was with the disciples in Damascus from some time. Immediately, he began proclaiming Jesus in the synagogues. He is the Son of God. Amen. I, I wanted you to see this part in Acts because it, it matters what Saul, what Saul and Paul, same guy, is going to tell Timothy in our reading today. So y'all found your place in Timothy, Yes? Good. I'm going to find my way there as well. 1 Timothy chapter 1, verses 12 through 17. It says, I give thanks to Christ Jesus our Lord who has strengthened me because he considered me faithful, appointing me to the ministry. Even though I was formerly a blasphemer, a persecutor, and an arrogant man. But I received mercy because I acted out of ignorance and unbelief. And the grace of our Lord overflowed along with faith and love that are in Christ Jesus. This thing is trustworthy and deserving of full acceptance. Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners. And I'm the worst of them. But I received mercy for this reason so that in me, the worst of them, Christ might demonstrate his extraordinary patience as an example of those who believed in him for eternal life. Now to the King eternal, immortal, Invisible, the only God, be honor and glory forever and ever. Amen. Amen. Let's start with a statement. You have a testimony. But here's the thing about testimonies. Your testimony may not be Christ. Your testimony may be that so far in this life you have tried your best. You've been a good citizen, you've been a good neighbor, son or a daughter, a father or a mother, who knows. But you have a testimony, regardless if it's a good one or not. You see, let's go back to the court for a second. Remember the name change idea. If today you were subpoenaed, subpoenaed to go to trial and you were to give a testimony, it wouldn't matter if you were for or against what was happening there. You have a testimony. Your testimony may support you and lift you up or it may condemn you, but you have a testimony. In Saul's life, he has a full testimony. You see, at one part of Saul's life, he was elite. He was the man. He was the guy that frankly, had the power. If you read back in Scripture, we see our first moments with Saul at the stoning of Stephen. Uh, this man who is um, a servant, a man who was called out to serve, all of a sudden starts preaching mightily in the gospel. And because he's a solid preacher, they bring him in expecting for him to renounce his faith. And instead, Stephen gives a great sermon that's outlined in Scripture. And in his sermon, he talks about the historical understanding of the need of a Savior. And he talks about it from as far back as he can into the present tense. And he talks about this Jesus who saves people. And those that are there tear their clothes and cry out that Stephen must be stoned. So they walk him out, and as they're heading to this field to stone Stephen to death, they take out their outer garments, and they hand them to Saul. And Scripture tells us it pleased Saul that they stoned Stephen. So just imagine how vile Saul was. In fact, he is so vile that now he's gone to the powers that be and said, Give me a letter that I can go into Damascus and I can find any of these followers of the way 
I can find them and bring them back here so that we can put them to death. And they do. And so he is on his way to find the people of the way. He just doesn't know what's in the midst of that moment. Let me ask you a question. This is a hard one, but I want you to just take a breath before you answer. Does God know outcomes? Of course he does. So in this moment, he saw the letter written from the church to send Saul on his way. And that day, you can just see Jesus waiting. This is a version of Jesus that I think we need to understand today. Jesus could have killed Saul. I mean, he appears to Saul right before his face. He sees Jesus. And that light man blinds him. And he just tells him, here's what you're going to do. You're going to go into the city. And then I will send somebody to find you. You imagine the other men that are with Saul? These guys were probably really bad dudes. Because what they're sent to do with Saul is capture Christians and bring them back to Jerusalem. They probably weren't weak men. I imagine that they were, well, they at least looked like soldiers. And they all stood back and went, We heard it. We just didn't see it. So they all usher Saul in, and Saul waits three days. You know what the Lord tells Ananias is, Saul will be praying when you find him. Three days of being blind and not eating and not drinking and praying. You ever wonder what Saul might have been praying? So here's the thing. Saul is a devout man of faith before this moment on the road to Damascus. He is amongst church leaders. He worships deeply. He is protecting everything historical about his faith that he knows. So this vendetta against Christianity is because he thinks it's false. He thinks it's a lie. He doesn't want his children to believe a lie one day. He doesn't want the people of his town to believe a lie and follow some charlatan that's just telling them falsehoods. So this vendetta is not just him being mean-spirited. This is Saul who is saying, I will protect the faith. And so here he is on his road to Damascus. He's encountered by Christ. He waits and Ananias comes in, and he, he says something unique in that passage in Acts. He says, Brother Saul. You ever thought about that for a second? How did Ananias answer the Lord when he first told him about Saul? He says, <laughs> God, that dude is scary. Have you heard the stories that he, I mean, the people of Jerusalem are terrified by that guy, and he has sent a letter to Damascus saying he is here to get us. So not only does Saul come into town, so does the letter. Ananias knows what Saul's doing. I think we'd all be afraid. And God goes, oh, Ananias, I'm going to use this guy and I will show him what he must suffer to follow me. This is crazy. That would be Saul's ministry. Amen. That he would suffer for Christ. Amen. From the very get-go, we know what his ministry will be. And that's what happens. Does God know the outcomes? Amen. Of course he does. So when Paul's writing to Timothy and he, he tells him these words, he starts in verse 12 by saying, I give Thanks to Christ Jesus our Lord who has what? Strengthened me. Because he considered me faithful, appointing me to the ministry. 
what is Paul's ministry but to share what, what he tells Ananias to the Gentiles, to kings, and to everyone. And he tells them, even though I was formerly a blasphemer, a persecutor, and an arrogant man. This is Saul's first testimony. He knows who he was. And maybe today we just need to be honest in this room and identify who we really are. And I'm not asking you to say it out loud. Please don't. (laughs) That would be awesome because we're recording this. And if you want it, I'm just kidding. But if we're being really honest, we all have a testimony. Our testimony is either that we stayed the way of Saul part one. Or God gave us something better. Paul tells Timothy he could have stayed there, but he received mercy because he acted out of ignorance and unbelief. Verse 14 says, And the grace of our Lord overflowed along with faith and love that are in Christ Jesus. And then he tells Timothy something deep. The saying is trustworthy and deserving of full acceptance. Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners. And I'm the worst of them. I don't know about y'all, but I don't know that I'd want that to get out. I don't know that I'd want the world to know that I'm the worst of the worst. But can I just tell you something about Paul that I know? As I read Scripture, there is no worst. There's no such thing. There is no such thing as the worst of sinners. You know how I know that? Because the mercy and love of Christ is too big for that statement. But look at what Paul says right after that statement. But I received mercy for this reason. So that in me, the worst of them, Paul says it again, Christ Jesus might demonstrate his extraordinary patience as an example of those who would believe in him for eternal life. Amen. Man, I feel like I know the patience of God. <laughs> I'm telling you, as long as I've lived so far, I feel like God has been ultimately patient with me. I feel like there's been moments that he shouldn't have been. But his grace and mercy are so good, he can be. Ephesians chapter 4, a passage we've read before, verses 17 through 24 says this, Therefore, as I say this and testify in the Lord, you should no longer walk as the Gentiles do and the futility of their thoughts. They are darkened in their understanding, excluded from the life of God, because of the what? Ignorance Ignorance that is in them, and because of the hardness of their hearts. They became callous and gave themselves over to promiscuity, to the practice of every kind of impurity, with a desire for more and more. But that is not how you came to know Christ. Assuming you heard about him and were taught by him, as the truth in Jesus to take off your former way of life, the old self that is corrupted by deceitful desires, to be renewed in the spirit of your minds, and to put on the new self, the one created according to God's likeness and righteousness and purity of the truth. Paul tells the church in Ephesus, we can't ignore this anymore. We can't claim that we don't know. Here's the thing about Jesus. Whether you believe he really died for the sins of people or not, one thing you can't ignore is this, the historical Jesus, that he really was a man who walked this earth. Let's just start there. Did you know that historians don't deny that Jesus was really here? Not one. Not one historian that I've ever heard of has gone, yeah, Jesus isn't real at all. They, they don't even try and go there. In fact, they can document that Jesus was alive when the Bible says he was. So even 
the Discovery Channel, who denies a lot about the things of God, can't deny a real Jesus. So let's start just with a basic understanding. You and I can't claim that we don't know. He is really a human that was here. Really a real Jesus. So let's just agree there to start. That Jesus is really a real man who came into the world. You know what else historians don't ignore? Because they can't go anywhere close to it. The virgin birth. They can't even touch it. They don't try to. That's strange, right? Historians aren't debating that. They just don't touch it. Curious. That's curious to me. So let's just go with just basic understanding then. Let's you and I agree Jesus was a real man, born of a virgin. That's Name another one. Nowhere else in history is this a claim of anybody else. Jesus. The end. Okay. So now we're there. A Jesus who comes, a man, really here, born of a virgin. Unique, different. You know what else they don't deny? That he was in the carpentry trade. No one's questioning it. No one once has said, you know what, Jesus was really here. He was a winemaker. No, one, no one's arguing this. Carpenter. Okay. We're, we're here together, right? How about Bethlehem? You can go today to Bethlehem and see that Jesus was born in Bethlehem. So we just keep walking this together, right? Born in Bethlehem, carpenter, born of a virgin, real man. So now you're, you've moved quite a ways into the life of Christ now. So now let's just talk some understandings. The Bible, whether you believe it or not today, makes a claim. Here's the claim. All have sinned. Let's just stop there. I don't want you to finish that verse just yet. All have sinned. So let's just, it's me and you in the room. I'm not going to ask you to raise your hand. You ever done anything you shouldn't? Everybody in this room? Yeah? Y'all with me? Yeah? Okay. So all have sinned. So the Bible holds a truth there, right? All have messed up. Everybody's done something they wish they wouldn't have. The, the scripture at the end of that says, and fallen short of the glory of God. Amen. Here's the problem. You may not believe that. You, you can, you're with me so far on this Jesus guy. And then you're with me on that first part of that verse. All have sinned. Okay. So you and I are just dealing with the last part of that scripture then. Falling short of the glory of God. So let's talk about what the glory of God is. The glory of God is holiness. Amen. That's the glory of God. So think of it like this. You walk into a room that's dark. And in our culture, what do you do? Turn on the light switch, right? So you, or you say, hey, Google. <laughs> I don't know. That may be your house. There's a few of you. But uh, you turn on a light. Why? Because it illuminates it. Lights up the room, right? Um, this is what the holiness of God looks like, is that where God is, he illuminates holiness. The problem is, if we've all messed up, it means we have rejected the light and we're dwelling in the darkness. Amen. And the Bible says this, for God so loved the world, that's you and I, that he gave his one and only son, that whoever, me and you again, would believe in him would not just perish, live in the darkness, but they would have eternal life. You would live in the holiness of God. You would then have the ability to say, for all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God, what he does is through Christ, he puts you in the glory of God. Okay, so you may be like, Pastor, I was with you with historical Jesus. I was with you that everybody's messed up, but it's hard for me to go from that 
to that because let's just back up. We all have a testimony. It, I don't know what your testimony is today of that you just, you're living your life and you hope that you're going to do enough right that at the end of this life, if you're good enough, you either get heaven or at least you get a nice tombstone. Maybe that's your life. Listen, I, I'm here to tell you today as a pastor of a church, I don't control your belief. It's not my job. My job is to play as though I am presenting evidence for your approval. We're back in the courtroom again. Historical Jesus. We've all messed up. So how do we, if heaven is real, get there? The Bible says this. It's not based upon your works or we would boast. We would do enough good and I'd be able to look at you and say, well, I've been a pastor of a church, so clearly I'm going to heaven. And you'd be like, well, I served in preschool this morning, so take that. You would go to heaven before me if that was the case. But it's not based upon our works, so we can't boast. It's not based upon our good. In fact, Paul argues that the best that we can offer is nothing. This is the guy that just told you in Scripture as he's talking to Timothy, I'm the worst of the worst, Timothy. So just hear it from the worst of the worst. Mercy is good. Grace is great. Love is powerful. You and I have a testimony. The question is, as we're in court today, how's this testimony end? You see, I believe many people will go to church their whole life and never encounter Christ. They'll sing about him. They'll read about him, but they don't know him. And so they'll go through their whole lives never experiencing him, just kind of making a list of things about him. So I want to explain it like this. When I was in high school, I took Spanish 2. Finished Spanish 1, went to Spanish 2. The project was learn somebody from Hispanic origins that you can talk to the class about. So I did. I talked about Chichi Rodriguez. I'm just kidding. Rodriguez. Chichi Rodriguez was a pro golfer. He's the guy that he'd make a putt and he'd turn over his putter and act like it was a sword and then put it away. I talked about all of his achievements, about how as a kid he learned to play golf by hitting rocks. Like this is Chichi Rodriguez. I explained everything about it. It's been years prior to this sermon that I've even thought about Chi-Chi. In fact, if you, I don't even know if he's alive. Somebody may can say, uh, I don't know. Some of you are Googling that right now. Anyways, I don't know. But all I'll say is this. I learned a lot about this man. Never met him. Never once have I ever met the man. I have nothing in my office signed by him. No clue. I don't know to this date how many tournaments he ever won. I did then. No clue today. I, I, don't, I don't know how accomplished he really was. No clue. I learned a lot about him at one point in my life, but I never was changed by him. I didn't mimic my golf swing after him. I, I, I know nothing about the man except his name and that he was a golfer. And for so many people in this room today, you know a lot about Jesus that he's a character in a book that you carried to church today, but you don't know him. You may at one point in your life learned a lot about him. He just hasn't changed your life. Some of you are still living your life as though your name is enough. And it's not. Today you might have walked into the room and your last name was Rockefeller. And that's great in history. But it doesn't get you to heaven. Amen. Back in the day, there were two men. They started a, a small business in California. They, uh, they worked very hard. They created a whole new system by which to do their business. They mapped it out on a tennis court and really figured out the best way to do their business they possibly could. And they started it. They were in a day where so many people had 
really obtuse businesses. And these two men decided they were going to make their business very small and quick and efficient. And they named it after themselves. Their last name, McDonald's. And the McDonald's brothers were doing just fine until a man came and knocked on their door, selling them shake machines. And what ultimately happened is he eventually bought them out. He undercut them and he, he kind of took them for their business. The McDonald's that you and I go to today is nothing like that original McDonald's brothers burger place. It changed because their name was not enough. Listen, today you have a name. And your name is your testimony. In Acts, we just heard Saul's name being mentioned. And he, he openly shares that he is still that guy to Timothy. He is the guy that was a blasphemer, a, per, a persecutor, an arrogant man. The chief of sinners, the worst of them. But he tells Timothy, it's not about the former that matters. Timothy, it's about what Jesus does that matters. Verse 16, but I received mercy for this reason, so that in me, the worst of them, Christ might demonstrate his extraordinary patience as an example of those who would believe in him for eternal life. Oh, Timothy, now to the king, eternal, immortal, invisible, the only God be honor and glory forever and ever. Amen. Amen. Jesus is patient, but he is not foolish. He will wait for you, but he will not tarry in that. He is patient, but not foolish. And today he knows your heart. Amen. He knows your outcome, and he invites you all of us sinners in this room, to know him. Amen. And the Lord loves you enough to give you that offer. And we cannot say that we don't know. But today you came in with a testimony. And it's attached to your name. In Revelation, it says to those that overcome, he will give a new name. Let me just tell you today, church, your name is not enough. Amen. You need Jesus. Amen. You need him today. One of my friends is a concert promoter, and uh, he invited me uh, to come and do a Q&A with a band, and I walked up to the Civic Center, and uh, there was somebody guarding the door, <laughs> And I said, hey, I'm Kyle Clayton. I'm the pastor at the church at Quell Creek. I'm here to do the Q&A with the band. And the person there, they didn't know me. That's okay. But they said this, and? And I went, well, I, I, I'm, I'm supposed to be here. And they're like, oh, that's great. My son was with me. He was a, a littler guy at the time, and I felt weird. It's like, well, uh, give me one second. Hey, man, I, I'm here at the door. Uh, yeah, I told the guy I'm Kyle. And, uh, yeah, okay. I hang up. And he goes, Ann, and I said, they're, they're coming to get me. And I stood there, looked at my son. He's looking at me like, are you sure we're supposed to be here? And eventually, here comes one of the workers, and they go, hey, Kyle, he's with us. And they went, okay, go ahead, sir. And me and the boy walked through. What I learned that day is this. And what I hope you hear is this today. You have a testimony and it has your name on it. Your name is not enough to get in. Amen. You need somebody on the other side. And that person on the other side has given you an invitation to come. And that, that invitation is you have sinned. And you are outside of the glory, the holiness of God. And today I invite you in because what Jesus did, he brings you in. And today your testimony can change. Amen. 
and it changes with a name. The name is Jesus. And today, if you would believe in him, He will not only change you from living in the darkness into light. He will bring you close to himself. And for the rest of your life, starting today, he will change your life forever. And it may not look like the path we would have written because we read too many novels and watch too many movies. But this Jesus, he is not too far off. And you have not gone too far in the darkness. He waits for you. And he is patient. And there is no chief sinner in this room. Because he is the king of kings. The Lord of lords. And he loves you. He loved you so much that he died for you. That you might have a life you and I didn't deserve. But are invited to have. Because of Jesus. I need that. And so do you. So if you would believe in this Jesus... If you would put your hope, faith, and trust in him. And the Bible says if you'll confess with your mouth. That isn't for us. That's for him. The Bible says you'll be saved. Why wouldn't you do that today? Why wouldn't you trust in this Jesus today? Don't leave this room without it. Know him. You have a testimony. Let Jesus be a part of it. Let me pray for you. Heavenly Father, I pray for my friends in this room. That if they don't know you today, they would put their hope, trust, and faith in you. That they would wander no longer. God, that with so many empty places that we have tried to put our hope and trust and faith in that have fallen before. And they will fall again. That today, as we put our hope and trust and faith in you, that you would speak over our lives. And that you would heal us. Heal us from our sin, Lord. Heal us from our unbelief. And God, we will just declare that you are worthy. You're worthy of every faith and trust that we have. So God, would you speak over this time right now? Speak into my friends' lives today. I pray this in your name, Lord. Right where you are, just leave your head bowed and eyes closed for just a second. I'm not going to ask you to raise your hand or do anything special. I promise you that. So Let's get that out of the way. Right where you are, before we move, before anything's done, do you know Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior? Right where you are, in in your heart, answer that question. Do I know Jesus as my Lord and Savior? It's a day you don't know. I want to talk to you. One of my friends up here would like to visit with you about how to walk forward with Jesus. Do not leave this room without answering that question. The next is this. If you are a believer of Jesus today, I'm asking you to do something in these next few moments. I'm asking you to pray deeply for people in this room that may not know him. Make no mistake about it. Spiritual warfare is happening in this room. And because that The Lord is calling his warriors to bow and pray and seek his face on behalf of somebody else. So here's my next question. If you believe in Jesus, if you trust him as Savior and Lord, will you do battle in these next few moments on behalf of your friends? Would you pray desperately that they would know him? Would you pray desperately that they would give them their life to Christ? If you would, I'm asking you to pray deeper than you've ever prayed. I'm asking you to plead on behalf of God that his Holy Spirit would win in the lives of people. These next few moments are moments of decisioning. Who will stand on behalf of those who need Christ? Lord, break our hearts for the things that break yours. Would you speak in this moment over every man, woman, boy, and girl And today that no one would leave this room, not one that doesn't know you as Savior and Lord. That every person that walks out these doors would have a hope and a future in you. And they would be certain of it. No doubt about it. And so Jesus, would you do that in this room? May your warriors pray as warriors today for the lives of people. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen.